Hi, welcome year 11 to our second round of podcasts. Um, Ms. Johnson and I are going to talk to you today about another piece of um, material that you would be required to analyse. It's actually from the May exam in 2010. So this is a prose piece and you'd be required to write a commentary on it. Um, it's from a piece of writing called Turn from 1911. And it was written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Okay, so we thought rather than read through this one with you that we'd um, just give you the opportunity to pause this if you need to. If you haven't read it recently, just because it's going to take a long time we read through it bit by bit. So if you haven't read the piece recently, get it in front of you, have a read of it, and then come back to us. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> So we thought one of the first things that we that we discuss here is the way in which um, the social and historical contexts are embedded with, with into this excerpt. So what we see um, initially and the clues that we can that we can gather from this is that it was written in 1911 or was certainly published then. So in terms of 1911, what was happening around then was for so there was the war, of course, around that time. Um, and we also remember this is going to be a much more conservative period of time in terms of um, marital relationships and expectations of women. And those things, I think, are apparent in the text, um, the dynamic between husband and wife, and even the idea, of course, of having um, a servant and somebody who's going to have a mistress, many a person who they work for. Um, so we see that class dynamic and the gender dynamic revealed in this text. The fact that there are there are hierarchies in society which aren't as prevalent or as obvious in contemporary work. So in terms of looking at um, gender and we'll move into characterisation, it's probably best just to work out what is actually happening or what what is being depicted here within within this excerpt. So of course it, it starts with the description of um, Mrs. Mariner, which is um, establishes what sort of person she is. It then uh, continues on to uh, quite a contrast, contrasting description of um, Goethe Peterson and, and her condition and her state at that time. Now, there are a couple of clues throughout this which, um, which lead us to believe that Goethe, as, as the maid or as the help within, um, within the Mariner household, is in fact pregnant. Mm -hmm. So this is something that some of you picked out on your first reading of it and some of you didn't. Um, but there are definitely clues that Goethe is in fact pregnant. So the first one is on line 16. Um, I mean, you could say even before that, I suppose, the fact that she's crying indicates that there is something amiss um, and that Mrs. Mariner is implies that the two of them are connected by something that has upset them. But then in that line 16, there's a really more striking clue where it says that Goethe wept for two. So from that point, you should be thinking, because you're reading closely and analytically, okay, who are those two people that she's weeping for? Who are those two figures that she weeps for? Um, second kind of clue, I think, that she's pregnant comes on line 25, when Mrs. Mariner says that she has never been jealous in her life till now. So there's an implication that Mrs. Mariner has something to be jealous about. Hang on, we'll just try and get rid of this message. Um, and that... Both of these women have something to cry about. There's two people in Goethe's life now, so we should be getting towards an interpretation that perhaps Goethe is pregnant. And there's probably one just a little bit before that on line 19. Goethe had, had personal shame to meet, a hopeless mm -hmm. future, and a looming present which filled her with unreasoning terror. Yeah. So, so the like idea of the uh, idea of the present and both presence and also something that's going to be offered um, in this instance. Yeah, so, you know, we all got from that that Gertrude is therefore pregnant. And then the last thing I think that you, have, that you want to be picking up in terms of just interpreting what is happening in this narrative is the implication that Mr Mariner is, in fact, the father. Um, so there are, again, a couple of clues that point towards that. Um, so the first one, I think, is probably on line 18, where Mr Mariner is introduced, and he's described as frankly admiring Goethe. So there's, there's definitely something quite paternalistic about his attitude. You know, he, he treats her as a father would, um, but there's an implication that there's something a little bit um, more salacious going on as well. Um, at first, you might just think it's admiration, but then look at that in conjunction with what comes after that. Mrs. Mary is not a jealous woman. She had never been jealous in her life till now. So for some reason, she feels particularly possessive of her husband, um, and envious of something else. That, in conjunction with Goethe's pregnancy, 
would imply that that is what she's actually um, jealous of or envious of. I think considering about characterisation and also the structure of this specifically, um, the point that you, that you make is more about um, the way in which Mr Mariner is introduced is quite important. The descriptions that we have of Mrs Mariner and then um, Gerda Peterson herself, they're, they're introduced through um, an emotional reaction. And, mm -hmm. You know, the, the connection between the two is, is made quite apparent. Mr Mariner, however, is a... Um, is introduced in quite a different way, and the mm -hmm. comment there is about his emotional attachment um, to Goethe, and of course it's separated by the comma, and so had his wife. Mm -hmm. what's, what's revealed later on, and certainly in the, in the, closing, uh, in the closing sentiments uh, of the excerpt, is that um, when it almost adopts the narrative of Mrs. Marin herself, she, she suspected her of illness, which was denied also, mm -hmm. and it almost is Mrs. Marin trying to cross out the suspicions that she has of her husband and her, her husband's relationship with, um, with Goethe. I suppose my question um, to you, Ms. Bohr, is do we see Goethe as a victim or do we see her as, um, as someone who has um, had some sort of salacious affair with, mm -hmm. with Mr. Marin? Yeah. So I think we can return to our senior social context, first of all, to um, answer that question. We can think that a, a girl of 18 who is in a subservient position to this couple, working as their servant or their maid in their house, is probably someone who we would assume is going to be considered a victim because she is, you know, the power dynamic is that those two have authority over her. Um, but aside from that kind of social context where we see that she's probably going to be a victim, there are also a lot of things in the text that, that present her in that way. Um, in spite of things, you know, like her being a larger frame than her mistress, grandly built and strong, um, there, are, there are repeated references to her as a child and as being childish. So um, on line 22, she's ignorant and childish. On line 27, she's teachable and plastic, so that impression of her being malleable and vulnerable. Um, she was, on line 31, a tall, rosy-cheeked baby. Although she has rich womanhood without, she has helpless infancy within. So there's that impression that, you know, she might physically appear to be an adult, but she's very vulnerable. And I think that's probably an excellent quote there. If you're looking at... Um if you wanted to analyse Goethe, Goethe Peterson as a victim of Mr. Bauer, I think that, that that quote is really sort of going to be the hinge for that line of analysis. Mm -hmm. For, um, of course, uh, the physical description of, um, of Goethe certainly seemed to be at odds with the emotional or the psychological description of her, of, of being a child, of being mm -hmm. childlike, and this idea of innocence and also of the, of the mariners wanting or needing to educate her. Mm. Yeah, and so once we've got that context of Goethe being this vulnerable figure, who of course when we open the passage is lying prostrate on the bed, as is Mrs Mariner, both of them physically sort of defeated by their, their recent experiences, both of them in this really vulnerable physical position. And then we have to look at Mr Mariner and the, the the description of Mr. Mariner and how he comes into the text. And I think once we think about him as a person who's had an affair or some kind of relationship with this quite young girl and deceived his wife, um, all of his comments sort of have a different air to them. We, we become probably quite critical of them. I think we also become quite critical as well of, of his absence as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. I mean, in terms, of, in terms of what is being presented here, you have... Um, home that is essentially fractured, yeah. um, well, that introduces Mrs Mariner and also, as also Goethe in different rooms of the house, trying to cope with this basically isolation. Mm -hmm. And the question of course raised is, where is Mr Mariner himself? And then looking down at line 35 where it says, when Mr Mariner had to go abroad for his firm, unwillingly, hating to leave his wife, he had told her he, quite, he, he felt quite safe to leave her in Goethe's hands. You can almost sort of hear his excuses as as a husband to his wife, mm. um, trying to soften the blow that he was going to be absent. And of course, he hasn't returned. Yeah, and those and in that context, the long, frequent, loving letters that deeply regret the delay. Well, that seems quite hypocritical um, and false by that point. Um, 
and you know his his suggestion that they should have a, a new honeymoon seems like a justification for his actions. So you've got to look at those kinds of comments in the context of the other things that we know about the characters, and that will shape her interpretation of him. I think following on from the letters that um, that he writes to his wife on line fifty two, where it comments, he often asked after little Goethe. Mm -hmm. I think even <laughs> which almost um, sort of turns your stomach a little, but it, it certainly it certainly instills his his perception of Goethe either as small or innocent or vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Which I think, if you were reading this as, as though she is a victim, I think that that would be a great line and a great quote to support that. Mm -hmm. um, just looking a little bit more closely at particular. Um, word choices in the piece. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting is around, from about line 40 to the end, that repeated use of the word month. Business is delayed from which went from month to month. Um, there's somewhere in there a description of him having been away for seven months ago. Yeah, that, in that same section, that was seven months ago. Um, in that context, you know, this is making me, once I've, I've worked out that she's pregnant, I'm starting to think, how long has it been? Could he likely be the father? So that could be another one of those hints that the writer is trying to draw our attention to how long he's been away and whether he's a plausible um, culprit as the, the father of this child. Well, it forces us to consider some of the gestation yeah, yeah. of women and also the idea of, of moons as well and what happens every month if you were going down the line of looking at this in terms of sort of menstrual cycles perhaps, then that, that could be something that you, you could analyse as yeah, well. But really... try not to get too far-fetched, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you've got that in your mind, though, those things are going to, um, those kind of images are probably going to be linked. Um, the other word that comes up a few times for the kinds of words are images of labour and not they're not used um, particularly to refer to the act of giving birth to a child, but of course they're associated with that in our minds. So on line 54, um, his wife is engaged in laborious efforts to educate the child, and on line 69, she laboured long to teach her more reservative men. And there's an irony of this, of course, in that Mrs. Mariner has no children of her own. She she taught Goethe and, and um, approached her as if she was her own child. She'd grown to love her as if she was. And now this child is, is having a child with her husband. So there's, there's an irony in that language. That probably leads to um, a character who we haven't actually discussed in much detail at all so far, and that is Mrs. Mariner herself. Mm -hmm. In terms of characterisation, Mrs. Mariner is, is quite an interesting character in her own right. Mm -hmm. So at the very opening of the excerpt, in her soft carpeted, thick curtained, richly furnished chamber, Mrs. Mariner lay sobbing on the wide, soft bed. Mm -hmm. She sobbed bitterly, chokingly, despairingly. Her shoulders heaved and shook convulsively. Her hands were tight clenched. She had forgotten her elaborate dress, the more elaborate bed cover, forgotten her dignity, her self control, her pride. In her mind was an overwhelming, unbelievable horror, an immeasurable loss, a turbulent, struggling mass of emotion. Given the fact that Mrs. Mariner opens the piece, I think, or the passage that we're reading, um, gives us, us the impression that the writer wants to draw our attention to her, and, and perhaps Gerda is more of a foil for the other characters. She's a figure who provides, um, who, who gives us an opportunity to look at the other characters in relation to her. She prompts um, a response in them that is revealing about them. Um, what do you make of all those adverbs and adjectives in that first passage, Mr Johnson? Well, I think the, the use of lists here, particularly of those particular adverbs, with mm. bitterly, chokingly, despairingly, we're certainly overwhelmed by emotion like Mrs mm. Mariner herself mm. is. In terms of the structure of, um, of the opening, not only does it, does it um, overwhelm us, but it, it enables us to feel a, a sense of sympathy, I think, mm. certainly, with, certainly with Mrs Mariner. Um, in terms of um, the idea of turbulence and also disorientation and the comment there on line number 10 and 11 where it likens the feeling that she's having mm -hmm. at this point to drowning, mm -hmm. I think is really, quite is really yeah. quite sympathetic. Yeah. The fact that, that she herself in, in some respect is a victim too, I, I would argue. Yeah, I agree. Um, and. And yet at the same time, I think there's something interesting going on with the pains that the writer is at to establish how luxurious their world is in, in comparison to Goethe. So that opening you know, establishes that it's not just carpeted, it's soft carpeted, it's thick curtained. 
is richly furnished. And of course, we're drawn to compare that to Goethe's surroundings in Sri Lanka after a thing fairly poorly finished. I mean, the same construction draws you to make an, an obvious comparison between the two. So, certainly, I feel sympathy for Mrs. Meredith right there is inviting us to feel that, but also to draw critical awareness to the role of power in this relationship and to the, the class differential between the two of them. They're, they're both suffering, they're both physically in the same um, position, but, well, I mean that they're lying down, one of them's pregnant, one of them's not, but um, they're, they're experiencing that suffering in, in very different environments. I think the, um, the lengths that the writer goes to to emphasise um, what um, Mrs. Mariner is wearing. She had forgotten her elaborate dress, the more elaborate bed cover, mm -hmm. and, and her surroundings is incredibly luxurious. So much so, the idea of forgetting who she is or forgetting mm. her class. We have this um, the, the image of Mrs. Mariner is this stoic, um, certainly what we would describe as sort of upper middle class, I suppose, mm -hmm. if you're going down to the classist argument. But analysed within, analyzed within um, historical and social context of, of the piece, we, we're seeing this as this is a woman who um, has chosen her career as opposed to, for whatever reason, to having children. Yeah, yep. And, and the result is that um, that she's that she's missed out in some respect. Yep. I mean, that can certainly be debated. Yeah, and I like the comparison that is implied by the description of Goethe around line 32, 33, um, that she has, by contrast, a braided wealth of dead gold hair. Um, I mean, it's dead gold hair, but it's it's a wealth of it, and her shoulders are mighty. And um, at another point, she's sort of compared to an Olympian, I think. Oh, she's a meek young goddess. So Goethe has her own strengths and her own sorts of power, um, which perhaps is implied as you know, a source of intimidation or threat at this point, given all that she knows, to Mrs. Mariner. And I suppose if we're looking at Goethe to build on the point you made before as being a character foil, so mm -hmm. um, a character who re um, reflects another, we can see here is that Mrs. Mariner is accomplished in terms of, mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, her PhD, yeah. and, uh, and I think she's the chair of, a, oh, who have been the faculty of a college, mm -hmm. and... Um, but of course, she she hasn't had children, mm. and she doesn't have the she's not um, prescribed in the same terms as Goethe herself. Mm. I suppose what's what's interesting is the expectation of people of a particular class, particularly mm -hmm. at the beginning, that we imagine her to be this stoic woman who has forgotten herself. Yeah, yeah. And um, something that we spoke about before this ball was about how much sympathy do we have for Mrs. Mariner? Mm. And I think on one hand you. You can read Mrs. Mariner as, and you can feel a significant amount of sympathy for her within um, this situation. For me, my sympathy for Mrs. Mariner falls short with the emphasis on the horror um, and the shame that she feels at the beginning. Yeah. That her, her thoughts don't seem to extend, I don't feel, to Goethe and Goethe's condition. No. It's, it is more about what will, what will others think. Yeah, and what is racing through her mind are her husband's words. And I think her humiliation at having misinterpreted um, mis the situation, she says she flattered herself that her words uh, on the subject of teaching Goethe were more reserved with men were at last effective. So, you know, perhaps quite understandably, what she's focusing on at this point is how did I miss this? What does this mean for me? How um, horrific is this for me? And... I wouldn't necessarily be critical of that, but it doesn't exactly direct sympathy towards her as much as if she didn't feel more sympathy for Gerda, um, or if she was more focused on, you know, and, and the person who in, in this time would certainly have been in quite a bit of serious trouble um, being an unmarried young mother would, would have, said, would have um, brought with a lot of social stigma and would have made it really quite difficult to get a job and to care for your child, so, you know, welfare systems were not what they are today. So. You know, this would have been a very serious situation for Gerda, not just because she perhaps wasn't ready to have a child, but for what it would mean for her in terms of her ability to care for herself. I think also looking at that, that point that you make about Gerda and to build on that, to have a look at the way in which Gerda um, is introduced. And you mentioned about the juxtaposition between the two, that we are forced to um, 
the contrast between Mrs. Mariner's description and Goethe's as well, and to think a little bit about what, um, how she is feeling at this point in time. And I think we can't help but feel sympathy for um, for Goethe, who is in quite a quite a terrible predicament given that it's 1911. Uh, looking also as well. Um, the way in which she's described, and we can't, once, once we're aware of um, her condition, her condition being that she is pregnant, having wept for two with a looming present, mm -hmm. we can't help but then to read um, the comments, particularly um, through the letters and the conversations of Mrs. Mariner and Mr. Mariner, with some lens of cynicism, mm -hmm. I feel, mm -hmm. whereas um, where comments, particularly about um, it is a perfection in a servant, but almost a defect in character where it talks about where it talks about her nature. She is so helpless and confiding. Yeah, you can see how that was exploited now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think um, if you're looking at um, at Goethe certainly as, as this victim of um, of Mr. Mariner, I think that would fit into it um, quite well. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this for on line 45 to put you completely on the spot? <laughs> where he says, if I should have eliminated from your scheme of things by any of those acts of God mentioned on the tickets, what, with the acts of God, what do you read into that? Mm. Um, I wonder if he's introducing the prospect of him not coming back, um, first of all, that, you know, in his own kind of um, indirect and sort of fairly dishonest way, he's starting to engage with the prospect of him not returning. Um, are you thinking of the acts of God being related to the pregnancy? Almost in a way, yeah. because I mean, it seems to be with the with the acts of God, it seems to be counted shortly after by your life is so rich and wide that no yeah. one lost even a great one would hold and cripple you. So he's justifying he, himself. He almost seems to be justifying his absence mm. to his wife there and saying that even if he doesn't return for whatever reason, of course, yeah. the dramatic irony is that we are aware of the reason. Yeah even before Mrs. Mara, who we assume is reflecting on this letter, is herself, that the act of God, whether it be his death or whether it be the pregnancy, mm. is going to be his vehicle for an excuse. Yeah. Just to, in case you don't know, acts of God usually refer to a tornado or, you know, something to do with the weather or something to do with, um, you know, an earthquake or something, something out of human control. So that's what the tickets are referring to. We're saying that it might have another meaning for him. Uh, I suppose a, um, a couple of other things that we need to, to look at is probably the way in which it's structured overall, which is, mm -hmm. um, we've spoken quite a bit already about how it begins, but in terms of structuring it, how, how would you analyse this in Yeah, so I think it's worth commenting on how many um, one-sentence paragraphs there are, quite fractured. Um, and there are, are sort of lots of different thoughts that are started, but perhaps not um, played out, not, not explored in great detail. So that might support that, that um, impression that we have of the characters as being emotionally overwhelmed, disordered, confused, trying to process a lot of new information. I think also um, looking, looking back on it, you almost have to read it a couple of times just to work out what is direct speech and also what is mm -hmm. um, what's being quoted from um, from letters or conversations and and I think that that as well we can imagine that Mrs. Mara who is mm -hmm. certainly granted some sense of authority in terms of the narrative here yeah. that she herself is is lying there with that elaborate dress having completely forgot forgotten herself mm -hmm. reflecting on reflecting on um, Goethe and you can imagine with all of these thoughts mm -hmm. running back through her. Ahead. And perhaps trying to piece together, even though it's not directly who through her voice is third person, but I think it's limited on this end. We're, we're getting her impression of events mostly. Um, we, we do step into Greta's experience for a short period of time, but mostly it's Mrs. Mariner's recollection, I think, is quite what we're hearing. I think probably one of the really difficult things to um, to analyse, particularly in prose, is, is the conclusion because, of course, you know, a lot of times in the very nature of an excerpt means that you may not have a resolution. Mm. It may not be tied up neat, neatly and tidily like a poem, perhaps, um, is. So just looking, I suppose, at, at the conclusion and what sorts of things are, um, are going through Mrs. Mariner's head. So it's probably interesting to look um, after line 55, 
where it says she had tried to teach Gerda, had grown to love the patient sweet nature child in spite of her dullness. At work with her hands, she was clever, if not quick, and could keep small accounts from week to week. It's certainly depicting Gerda as quite a simple, mm -hmm. a, a simple character. But to the woman who held a PhD, who had been on the faculty of a college, it was like baby tending. Mm. There's this, I think there's a there's the, a point being made about superiority, mm -hmm. about class, and also about an educated woman almost almost sort of trying to defend her actions. And, and seem, there seems to be a voice of that she put herself out of helping Gerda. Yeah. And, underlying bitterness, I feel. Yes, I think so too. And with that repetition of her suspicions, she suspected the yellow home sickness at the end. She suspected her of illness. And both of those are denied. At last, she suspected her of something which could not be denied. There's a sense of frustration that, you know, took that series of suspicions and denial before ultimately, of course, I assume that Gert's Gert's pregnancy just became um, far too apparent for any other conclusion to be drawn. So... Any final messages or any final reminders or anything that you can think of the students miss for when um, they're analysing prose? I think I was just going to say that, you know, like a simple thing that you could talk about is the choice of adverbs, the choice of adjectives and the verb tense. That's something that we haven't talked about a lot. Um, and I don't want to go over the whole thing again. We can talk about the adverbs a little bit at the beginning, but you can just talk about what is in the present tense, what is in the past tense, and how that reflects a changed attitude and a kind of hindsight in the situation. Um, that helps, you know, shape our interpretation of what's going on and how the characters feel about it and how we feel about them. But, yeah. And I suppose my final advice um, was, would be to encourage students to make sure that they're looking over the literary terms frequently, mm. even if we're not covering it in class. class. <laughs> yep. Even if we're not covering it in class, that meta language is your vehicle to analysing this. So um, learning those terms because everything in your uh, literary commentary needs to be extracted from the text and, and built on from that. And arming yourselves with as many different words and techniques as possible is going to enable you to do that. And it's just going to increase your um, your ability to be succinct, I think, as well. You know, those literary devices are just going to enable you to do things much more efficiently. So get cracking on your holidays.